Hello, my name is uh, Keith Fox, and we're here at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions, and we're discussing some of the very interesting findings from today, and specifically, one of the trials called AIM High. And I'm here with John and Bill, and I want to get them to talk a little bit about themselves and their interests, and then we're going to talk about the study. Uh, John, why didn't you start? Uh, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, presently a pre a president of the European Atherosclerosis Society and director of the Atherosclerosis and Dyslipidemia Research Unit of the National Institute of Health in CERM at uh, Hôpital de la pitié sur in Paris. Wonderful. Bill? Thank you. I'm professor of medicine and preventive medicine at the University of Buffalo in Buffalo, New York, and uh, I had the privilege of being one of the co-PIs for the AIM High trial. Okay, so both of you know a lot about this subject, <laughs> and uh, we'd like to start off with uh, you, Bill, sure. by outlining the design, the AIM, and what the key findings were. Okay, so AIM High was really undertaken as a secondary prevention trial to assess whether we could benefit clinical outcomes by treating the residual risk attributed to low levels of HDL in patients with established cardiovascular disease who were being optimally treated with statins. And I think we all accept the fact that even in patients who can achieve uh, and, and maintain low levels of LDL, that and specifically the level uh, in, in the study was? Well, specifically, these were patients who came in with uh, uh, levels that were below 180 by trial design, but it turns out that actually 94% of the patients who uh, were enrolled in the study had been receiving a statin for anywhere from one to five years. And so right, right. what we encountered was a, a, was a far lower, a much lower baseline So this LDL. is a treated population for quite a long period of time. That is correct. So, uh, and so very simply, the design of the study was to contrast one of two strategies. Uh, patients were randomized to receive simvastatin in a dose of 40 to 80 milligrams per day, plus extended release niacin uh, at least 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams a day. So high, high dose extended release niacin mm. versus a statin arm, uh, which consisted of simvastatin 40 to 80 plus a placebo, uh, for niacin, but in the placebo tablets, there was a small 50 milligram dose of immediate release niacin, sufficient to impart a cutaneous flush. So that people got the flush and they weren't able to unblind. Correct. So to mask the identity of treatment to both the participants. But the without patients. having a therapeutic effect with that low dose. Or, or so we thought. So, yes. <laughs> this so, is, this so, is an important point. So, yeah, so, so, so we might come to that. Or we, we will we, come to we that. We will come to that. And then the, the, the target LDL range for the study was 40 to 80 milligrams per right. deciliter. So, so an aggressive an, target. An aggressive target, in part because that's where the field is moving to, mm -hmm. if you will, lower is better. Mm. And we recognized that not all patients would be able to tolerate the 80 milligram dose of simvastatin. Right. So in order to get into that range, we also decided to make azetamibe 10 milligrams daily available as needed in either arm. So the primary endpoint was a composite of, uh, of cardiovascular. How often was azetamibe needed? It was given in 22% of, uh, of the monotherapy arm and 10% of the, uh, uh, the combination dyslipidemia okay. therapy. Right. Arm. So the, this was an event-driven trial. Mm -hmm. uh, the intent was to accrue 800 events over the course of a seven-year follow-up with an average 4.6-year follow-up. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, postulated that there would be a 25% relative risk reduction uh, with the combination of, uh, of extended release niacin and simvastatin being superior to simvastatin alone in reducing that. And the uh, mechanism that you're targeting? The mechanism that we're targeting is actually the fact that uh, niacin does multiple things. Uh, it raises HDL, but it lowers uh, LDL, it lowers triglycerides, it lowers lipoprotein A. But of and course this is in the context of other therapies that are lowering LDL. That is correct. So, but the specifics of the study is that we restricted enrollment to patients who had sure. low levels of HDL, less right. than 40 milligrams per deciliter for men, less than 50 for women. Okay. So that was the target population, yep. and a very different design, I might add, than HPS2 Thrive. Yes. So uh, the, the study uh, has been underway since 2006, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in late April, uh, during our last uh, DSMB meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we learned that uh, the uh, boundary for lack of efficacy had been crossed some months earlier. And in addition, uh, there was an unexpected uh, increased number of ischemic strokes that were, uh, that were noted in the niacin-treated patients. Mm. 
So uh, that led to the DSMB recommending to the NIH uh, that the study be stopped roughly 18 months earlier than mm -hmm. the projected uh, termination, which mm -hmm. would have been in December of 2012. And over the last several months, of course, we've been working very uh, frantically to close out the study and make certain that we have all the events that have been uh, accrued and, and adjudicated. Mm -hmm. So in the final analysis, uh, what we uh, wound up showing was that there were 274 primary events uh, in the uh, uh, simvastatin treated patients uh, mm -hmm. versus 282 events in the niacin plus simvastatin treated patients, a hazard ratio of 1.02 and 95% confidence intervals that range from uh, 0.87 to 1.21. So clearly a non-significant. So, but but uh, the difficulty is those confidence bounds include the possibility of both hazard and benefit. Absolutely. So uh, again, uh, the, if, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, that were presented this morning and of course uh, uh, published in the New England Journal, they're absolutely spot on mm -hmm. superimposed over mm -hmm. the entire mm -hmm. duration of treatment. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that, of course, um, uh, was of concern to us uh, was uh, this signal of stroke. Mm. Uh, and when we finally completed the very detailed, comprehensive analysis of all those uh, neurologic events, it turned out that there was a numerical imbalance uh, uh, for total ischemic stroke, mm. 18 uh, versus 29, 18 in the simvastatin group versus 29. But I gather a number of these strokes happened when the individuals were not on therapy. That's correct. So eight, eight strokes occurred after discontinuation of mm. blinded therapy, and in all eight instances, those patients had been assigned to receive niacin. So mm -hmm. uh, if you look at actually the, uh, the likelihood of stroke occurring on treatment, it was 18 versus 21. Yeah. Nevertheless, the, the p-value uh, for the ischemic stroke endpoint turned out to be uh, non-significant, 0.11. Mm. And uh, you know we're we're left with uh, a, a rather um, um, hollow feeling about the fact that uh, this is uh, was an important secondary prevention trial uh, uh, designed to really address the issue of residual risk associated with low levels of HDL, and we also know from earlier studies with niacin, particularly at the coronary drug project, where there was a late benefit associated mm -hmm. with that versus placebo. And in the VA HIT study with Chem5 Brazil versus placebo, there was also a late separation in the Kaplan-Meier curve so, in around two so years. So frustrating. 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 Yeah. Okay, John, I want some insights from you into, into this study. Did it go long <coughs> enough? Um, you know, uh, this issue about early ter termination and futility. Hmm. Well, several points that were presented by Bill this morning mm. uh, raised concern. Keith. Uh, the first is that a substantial proportion of patients in the active arm and also in the placebo arm with low HDL cholesterol at high risk had received intensive therapy, uh, both lifestyle and statin therapy, mm. for a substantial period of time. Right. Um, more than four years, I mm -hmm. believe. Um, Forty percent for more than five years. Yes. Right. Now. This is a critical point, why? Because we saw in the Saturn trial presented mm. today that even over a period of two years of intensive statin therapy, one can achieve, at least as evaluated by IVUS in coronary arteries, a significant degree of, re of regression. Yes, uh, in terms of some of the plaque volume measurements. Absolutely, absolutely. So the question then that we derive from this uh, analysis is whether or not the individuals, the patients who were included in the trial, had lipid poor, mm. potentially stabilized plaques. We know mm -hmm. that statin treatment depletes lipid. We know that statin treatment attenuates intraplaque inflammation. We know that statins increase the proportion of fibrous matrix content in plaques. Right. All of those factors suggest to me that the therapeutic impact mm. of the active niacin regimen was potentially totally inadequate to provide further benefit beyond the 
statin acquired benefit, statin mediated benefit, which from which the but majority. That's an important message. It's exceedingly important. Yes. Exceedingly and, important. And, and, and remember, we started in 94% of patients, the starting baseline LDL was 71 mm -hmm. milligrams per deciliter. On treatment, we drove it down to 62. Right. And, and we saw the expected anticipated uh, salutary effects of, of niacin on the lipid profile. Okay. HDL went up 25%, triglycerides down 29%. LDL down an additional 16%. Okay, so Bill. Despite those changes. Okay, Bill. No. Low is better, but very hard to show an effect yeah. by the time you get to low, low. Yes. So, but but, but yeah, yeah. Do, do excuse me. Uh, and of course, the levels of LDL attained uh, by Bill and his AIM High investigators yeah. on treatment are rather comparable to those presented today in the Saturn trial. Indeed. On, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Indeed. So that, that would be the first point. The second point is. That the because of the very significant increase in HDL cholesterol level in the placebo arm mm. of the order of ten percent, yeah, right. this approached the absolute level of increase in HDL cholesterol in the active arm. In the active so the nice. delta was actually four milligrams per deciliter. Right. The question then that we must ask ourselves is for a four milligram per deciliter increment in HDL cholesterol in those individuals on who had received intensive study treatment, what period of time Surely would we have needed? Surely this is grossly and underpowered in terms of time to achieve that. Yeah. Well, this of course Bill alluded to because yes. from the coronary drug project we yeah. know that benefit from niacin expressed itself 10, 15 years later Okay. Indeed, several years after the initial niacin treatment okay. had been stopped. So there are major questions here. And just allow me, Keith, one other point. And that is that we do know that niacin elicits both lipid dependent and lipid independent benefit on the arterial wall. Mm. And we do not know what the dose dependency of those effects are. There is no question that niacin induces vascular anti-inflammatory effects, well documented now. Yeah. We don't know what the time course is and we don't know what the dose dependency okay. is. We cannot exclude therefore that right. there may have been benefit, right. vascular benefit, right. in the placebo group in the AIM high trial. Okay, so that can't be excluded. What I want to do to round up is I, I want your take home message for the general cardiologist who has some <coughs> of their patients on niacin today. Okay. So I think what we can safely conclude from the results of AIM High is that in stable, non-acute patients with established cardiovascular disease who are able to achieve and maintain very low levels of LDL, uh, we have uh, data from this trial to support the fact that there's no additional benefit uh, of raising HDL and lowering triglycerides with niacin. I think the results apply only to the types of patients that we included in the trial. And again, by trial design, Keith, we excluded patients with ACS, AMI. Indeed. And we didn't get enough patients Indeed. Who's, uh, who had really, uh, who were statin naive. Okay, so, so, so the patient walks in tomorrow right. and says, I've read about this very interesting trial. Right. Doc, do I continue on niacin? I think it depends. Uh, and, and so I'm not willing to say at this point, and I think I do agree with Professor Barter in this regard, I think it's premature to abandon uh, the, the use of niacin, we, we, we await the, the outcomes of a large outcomes trial, uh, the HPS2 Thrive trial in 25,000 yeah. patients. So I think at this point we need to be cautious and judicious okay. about where we All use right. this drug. I wanted to ask John though two questions if I All might. Right. Number one, it, do, does the same high suggest that there is a floor, that there is a uh, a level below which we can't discern incremental benefit with LDL. And then secondly, are there any similarities between enhanced and AIM high in your view? Well, I'll take the first question, uh, the second question first, Bill. Uh, for, for me, there is clearly uh, a resemblance between the situation we encountered in enhanced and that we're now encountering with an AIM high, simply because again, in enhanced, patients who entered the trial who were primarily presenting with familial hypercholesterolemia had been uh, treated for extended periods of time with uh, eff efficacious statins. Mm -hmm. And when the data were analyzed, their baseline A IMTs actually fell within mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. confidence intervals for the age and sex uh, yeah. of those individuals. So clearly, uh, the, the, the study the was- The background treatment worked. 
it certainly uh, did. Absolutely. Now, the situation is a little different here. Um, I would uh, beg to differ a little with Bill because the increment in HDL, um, in my opinion, we cannot definitively evaluate the question as to whether HDL raising on top of LDL at goal is, gives ad additive benefit or not when an individual has already received prolonged statin treatment. So my, the question we really want to address with the only agent that is available at the moment to effectively raise HDL, which is niacin, the question we really want to ask is, in individuals who, are, who have a component of their risk due to low HDL cholesterol, those are the individuals we should be targeting, mm. and we should be targeting them as, as early as we possibly can diagnose and identify them. In other words, we should be using combinations, mm. almost certainly, of statins and agents mm -hmm. like niacin to lower LDL and concomitantly raise HDL cholesterol so that the tremendous eight low HDL associated risk can be neutralized but, as rapidly but, as possible. But, John, we lack evidence. but <laughs> we don't we have the evidence. The evidence. <laughs> we Absolutely. Evidence. You know, the, the patient is walking we, into your hospital in Paris and they say, look, doc, yeah, uh, I know about all this background that you've told me, but I want the evidence. Well, I'm very concerned that many clinicians, because of the AIM high trial, may say we no longer need That's okay. my fear. to raise okay. HDL. And I believe yeah. that we cannot make that statement because the AIM high trial, for me, is faulty in terms of recruitment, in terms of the fact that agents were using the placebo arm that in part may have balanced out the effects in the active arm, and the question also, should the trial have been stopped, given that the fact that this agent may need at least five years to show, mm. uh, to really right. manifest benefit. Right. So, so unfortunately, niacin is a complex agent, and we really don't know what the sweet spot for niacin, and I'm talking specifically about niacin, yeah. not about other HDL raising agents, Keith. Yeah, okay. So. Can I summarize this mm. with the, uh, the, the concept that in people that are well treated with statins yes. and have been stabilized for a period of years, right. it's very difficult to show incremental gain. Yes. But I would use an expression, I would use an expression that the, we have in the legal system in Scotland, non-proven, rather than proven that it doesn't work. Yes. Right. Uh, keep, do excuse me, I would agree. And I believe that the actual design of the trial is not, do excuse me, Bill, as solid conceptually as we would have wished because of the inclusion of niacin in the placebo arm and because of the major increase in HDL cholesterol in the placebo arm. Okay. So okay. I am very concerned that, that many of our colleagues may jump to conclusions mm -hmm. without considering the facts in the AIM high trial. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think that th that is a really important message for the wider population out there. We've yeah. got to look carefully at these studies, yes. we've got to learn from them, and we've got to look to the future. We do. And th there are, uh, you know, I think it's encouraging, actually, that in well-treated individuals yeah. um, who've been on high <coughs> doses of statins, it is very tough to, sh to, sh right. uh, to show incremental gain on top. And, and we did answer an important question. It just wasn't the question we set out initially yeah. to answer. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it, as you said, Keith, if you can get and maintain a low yeah. level of LDL, at least in this trial, we could not demonstrate yeah. that additional treatment with niacin was any benefit in terms of reducing clinical okay. events. And so we have to await the results of HBS to thrive. We do. We do. So I, I think that is our closing point from uh, AHA uh, scientific sessions tonight. Thank you both very much for very interesting contributions. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Keith.